Thank you, everyone, and welcome to European Distance Learning Week, uh, which is a uh, activity put on and sponsored by Eden, and in parallel with the National Distance Learning Week that is supported by um, by USDLA in the United States. We've got a great session for you today. Unfortunately, one of our speakers um, will not be able to attend uh, due to a to a, um, an emergency. Um, Rike will not be here, but that will give us more time for discussion. Uh, we're going to start out with some introductions, then Hamish is going to present, then John and Jill, uh, and then we'll have the questions and answers. So if you have questions, um, please be sure to put them in the chat box um, and we will answer them, uh, or the panel will answer them toward the end of the session. Um, but first we're going to start with, um, with Hamish Mac McLeod, who is from the University of Edinburgh, and he'll be talking to us about playful learning, orchestration, and identity. Um, Hamish is a member of the British Psychological Society and of the Royal Society of Biology and, chartered, and is a ch and chartered biologist. He's also a senior fellow of the Higher Education Academy. His areas of research are learning technology, learning and teaching online, and human response to technology. So without further ado, I'd like to give the floor over to Hamish. Thanks a lot, Lisa, and um, good afternoon, colleagues. Lovely to be here. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, Lisa, your voice was breaking up a little bit as you were talking, so please do shout and intrude. I won't be able to keep track of all the bits on the screen uh, to know who's saying what, so Lisa, please do, uh, do interrupt if there's any voice or other problems. Um, right, let's see. Yes, good, that's me. Uh, so, first of all, if anyone wants to contact me hereafter to discuss anything that I've raised, do please uh, feel free. We've got a very short time uh, this morning, although we may have more time for discussion. So I'd like to uh, give a, a, an overview and then leave uh, as much time as possible for folks to, to chat. Um, a bit closer to my mic. Um, right, okay, I've got my... Uh, uh, let's see if I can give you any more volume. Uh... Okay, and I'll try and hold the cord so that the mic's in the right place. Right, so to give you a little bit of background, first of all, uh, the context from which I'm talking is our MSc program in digital education at the University of Edinburgh, and that's where the experiences that uh, I would be calling upon have, have come for me in the last uh, 10 or 12 years. Um, in particular, as Lisa said, I want to talk about uh, games or playful approaches in learning. So that's what I'm advocating, as it were, this morning. Um, yes, thank you for the, uh, the sound. Right, okay. Um, and that is coming from one of our courses on that uh, program, the Introduction to Digital Game-Based Learning, and that I've taught along with my uh, colleague, uh, Clara O'Shea. Um, the other thing I'd just like to point out to you is this manifesto, which the team at Edinburgh put together, a manifesto on teaching online. Uh, it's a provocation, so we'd like to provoke you and we'd like you to uh, play along with us. It's a playful activity. Uh, and we'd like you to be provoked and to uh, to respond to some of the things that we've uh, addressed there. Why a manifesto for teaching rather than talking about learning? Um, I think, again, this is important to what I'd like to be saying perhaps today. And um, it is this idea that uh, in order to highlight the centrality of the student in this whole business, we have tended to talk about learning, to emphasize learning and to de-emphasize the role of the teacher. And we have felt that it's important essentially to help the teacher to know what he or she should be doing. Uh, and that's why we want to, to talk about what it is to be, uh, to be a teacher. Um, we are an online program. And I think it's important to say that blending uh, technical uh, approaches into a campus-based program is quite, quite different from using those same approaches in a program that's entirely online. And I have done a bit of both. Um, I think the, the distinction is important. 
uh, and that might be something that we'd like to come back to. But we uh, on the MSc in Digital Edu Education are uh, forefronting the online, uh, as the slogan says, we are the campus. Not exclusively, but we are part of the campus. We are there with you. So what does it mean uh, to teach? And I, a phrase that I really like is this notion of the orchestration of experience. And, and, and that's uh, central to what I'd like us to be thinking about today. Um, this comes from a book, Making Connections, by Kane and Kane way back in 94. So they say, because the learner is constantly searching for connections on many levels, educators need to orchestrate the experiences from which learners extract understanding. They must do more than just provide information or force memorization of isolated facts, however that might work, uh, and skills. So the job of the teacher is to create experiences from which learners can learn. And I would see that as being uh, very well structured by an approach which is playful uh, and is not necessarily game based, but game informed. Uh, and that's the, the message that I would like to be promoting here. In passing, and I think models like Julie Salmon's um, five stage model are very, very valuable here, we have to invest in preparing our students to engage in this way, collaboratively, actively uh, in their learning. It's often not something that comes naturally. And so as this five stage model suggests, we need to take account of the technologies uh, and take account of student motivations and experiences. Uh, and this has to be done at the level of the, uh, the mere access and the socialization round about the tasks and then moving on to the substantive business of the domain area that we're wanting to be teaching in or teaching about. Uh, but it is this notion that we have to invest up front in preparing the students to engage in this way. So I want to, to locate this. And uh, again, we know all of this, but just to locate this in uh, a structure of what it might mean to talk about active learning. So we know that knowledge is constructed by the student. It is not imparted by, uh, by the teacher. And that this is well done within uh, a supported and scaffolded social context. We know also that it's actually well, that, that, that the construction of knowledge is well catalyzed by the building of things in the real world. As Papert says, he talks about learning through programming. So we might be building physical artifacts, or we might be building conceptual artifacts, such as, uh, as, as programs. We might be building uh, games. We might be constructing images and telling stories around about those, those images. And when we take this online, then we mobilize opportunities to engage vast numbers. And this notion of connectivism from George Siemens and, and Stephen Downs uh, helps us to think about what unique things are going to be uh, uh, possible when we have connected uh, groups of students, distributed, possibly distributed across the planet. Um, another level of distribution here is this notion of distributed cognition. So learners are connected not only to other people, but they're connected to tools that they can use in this knowledge construction business. Uh, and so learners, we can think of them as socio socio-technical assemblages. Uh, I like the phrase from David uh, Engelman's recent book, half of us is other people. Uh, and I think that's a very important notion. I've listed here on the slide, I won't spend any time on it, but we can think about different ways in which the interactions of uh, teaching and learning are social, online, there is an opportunity for the hyper sociability of the connected world. And this notion too, which I think we miss often of the eusocial, the ultra social, that humans unique among our primate cousins uh, divide our labor. And this is not something that we forefront in education often. Um, it's a very individual, it can appear very individual. 
uh, matter, particularly when we think about assessment. So we may find that we are working collaboratively with our students, but when it comes to assessment, it's every man or woman for themselves. And so the assessment needs to map onto the, uh, uh, the teaching structure that we're trying to promote. So I think, if, if I can put it like this, in summary, here's the point at which I'd like to uh, engage with you about some of these ideas about uh, playfulness and about uh, identity. So we can think of teaching as creating good tasks. And uh, a colleague of mine, Michael Begg, described a game as a task with a backstory. And I think that's a very, very good uh, definition. Because what we're thinking about when we think about the backstory to a task is we're trying to forefront the relevance to the learner of what it is that they are doing um, in these uh, learning activities that we give to them. Now, that's very easily done in the context of professional learning, like education, law, medicine, and so on. But it's not so easily done, perhaps, in, um, uh, as it were, the pure academic subjects like history or psychology or anthropology. But we can think about ways in which students can play games within the world that, that we are introducing them to. And paradoxically, perhaps, this idea of excuse me, of fantasy and role play can make the activities uh, more relevant and more meaningful to the students day to day. Clearly, as I suggested, we want to mobilize the social and constructing ways in which these experiences can be um, social and collaborative is very, very important. And again, if we think about connectivism, the possibility that we can make uh, connections across the planet to uh, provide opportunities for one of our students to be a resource for another. And so the students are in touch and are doing things. Uh, they're finding out about uh, other places, other cultures, other societies, other perspectives on the area that they're, they're working on by utilizing the links that they have with uh, distributed peers. Again, though, as I say, we need to invest in this up front. We need to take time. And that is going to be time out of our curriculum, if you like, in order to give the students the confidence, the tools, the skills, um, and the social opportunities to, um, uh, to work in this collaborative way. And finally, just to highlight again, we need to think of ways in which we can align the assessment with these learning approaches. And this is something that we're talking about uh, a lot in Edinburgh, uh, and thinking of new ways of assessing. There is absolutely no point in having uh, novel approaches to teaching and learning if those aren't mirrored and aligned in what we do in our assessment. Because whether we like it or not, and again, this is a contentious idea, but uh, assessment does, to a very real uh, sense, in a very real sense, and a very great extent, uh, constrain and direct the student's learning. What we think it's important to assess, they will see uh, as being our view of what is important for them to learn. And so if our assessment doesn't match with our uh, approach to, uh, to teaching and learning, then uh, we have a problem. Um, I, forgive me, I think I should probably stop there. Um, that's covered the ground, and I, you know, I, I hope to, to give more time for discussion and questions uh, at the end. So if, if I may, Lisa, I'll, I'll pause uh, uh, at that point. The different ways of approaching learning design. Um, our next speaker is going to be John Trassler. And uh, just to give you a little background about John, um, John is the founder of eLearn, which provides consultancy and distance and blended learning, together with training programs for individuals and organizations management, leadership, and coaching. With over 25 years in the uh, experience in the education and training business, John has managed multinational companies for Pearson and New Corporation in both Europe and Asia. 
John holds a master's degree and is a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development and is president of the European Association of Distance Learning. Uh, again, um, questions uh, will be done at the end of the panel session, so if you can just hold your questions. If you do have questions that come up as the speakers are speaking, feel free to enter them into the chat box. So, John, your slides are now up, so you can go ahead and start with your presentation. Thank you. Excuse me, John, this is Lisa. Can you share the results of the polls? And from the poll before, we're Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you very much, Lisa. I'm. Um, I hope I'm not too croaky for everybody. I, I joked earlier in the uh, in the warm up that I was hoping not to do a Theresa May. So um, I'll try and speak clearly. I do have some water if I get into trouble. So let's hope that that, that will be okay. Um, I just want to say that um, my perspective, my experiences that I'm bringing to you today, come from uh, being part of the European Association of Distance Learning. Um, and having looked at the, um, the, the trends and the inputs uh, from, from our members. So uh, much of what I'm going to say is a kind of a, a bit of a, a global tour of a, few, of a few things, most of which perhaps will be trends and so on that people are, are, are picking up on. Um, so what we're going to, um, what we're going to look at uh, in the next 10 or 15 minutes, I think, is what we know is happening with visual education and the kind of things that are driving that. Uh, and um, I'm going to focus primarily on, on video uh, and maybe we'll look a little bit at, at apps. Um, I suspect that uh, quite a few of you are, are already using both of these, but um, these are trends that our members are, are continuing to, to see uh, are developing and, and so on. Um, just to put it into perspective, the European Association of Distance Learning uh, has got something like about um, 4,000 different courses uh, from 60 members. Uh, and about a million students in, in Europe. Um, we're in the, um, the for-profit sector, so that gives us a slightly different perspective probably on what we're doing, but nevertheless, quality uh, and uh, learner experience are central to the sort of things that we, that we look at. So, um, what do we know? Um, what do we know uh, in terms of where we are right now? Well, Hamish was um, giving us some, some inputs there on, on learning, um, learning theory and, and support and so on. Um, and I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I think it's, uh, it's pretty clear that although there's been some discussion about the relative merits of visual uh, activities with the use of videos, replacing flipped classrooms and so on, and how effective that is, um, it's those of us that are engaged in distance education kind of tend to take it as a, as a red that if we design our things on Kolb and give people a rich experience uh, and an opportunity to reflect, uh, then hopefully we're going to get uh, a good result. Um, and so that becomes, you know, that becomes kind of central to what we're, uh, what we're, what we're looking at. Um, there is also uh, recently some uh, evidence from Thomas Nigel at Stanford uh, about the, um, the, the um, use of mental imagery and how can that can accelerate learning. So I think we're on reasonably safe ground when we start to Think about uh, engaging more visualization in our content and in the processes that we are we are looking at. Um, we mustn't forget, of course, that although uh, people like Prentice Hall and Pearson tell us that something like about 65% of the population are visual learners, um, nevertheless, uh, that still leaves a substantial number of people who are perhaps going to be benefit from having different learning styles and different processes uh, in place to, to support what they're doing. Um, and, and I just pick an example there. This is taken from the University of Queens, uh, Queensland. Uh, and you'll see if you, as you read through it that we're already not just talking about um, the use of visualization and video uh, for the presentation of, uh, of teaching, but also getting students engaged in, in using and, and devising uh, that kind of content and so on. So um, let's have a look at some of the um, some of the market research. I've got uh, all the references for the things that I'm using today. By the way, are in the last slide, and you'll, you can have a look at those after one. Um, this is from the um, the Kaltura report for 2017, uh, and um, it doesn't just cover the US; it covers uh, quite a large number of uh, parts of the world. 
but um, something like 99% of US institutions uh, report that teachers are including video. Um, I'm not sure if we can do uh, the little poll now, but um, it'd be interesting to see uh, how many people uh, are using video. So maybe we could just do a little poll and, and see if we get uh, anybody who's, um, who's currently using video. Okay, so we can see the numbers. Well, I don't know if you can see them. I can see the numbers coming in. Uh, yeah, so uh, a fairly substantial number. That seems to sort of um, back up um, the figures that, uh, that are in that report. It's creeping up to a 90-10 split. Um, okay. Yeah, so large numbers of people using uh, some form of video uh, in their teaching uh, and so on. Okay, well, thank you, thank you for that. Let's end that poll. I'll just um, I'll just move on to the um, to the next one here. Is um, what type of video uh, is actually um, is actually being used? Um, let's just see. How can we start this? Okay. So we're going to look at some um, we're going to look at some trends uh, from the um, from the market research uh, in a moment, um, and we'll see how those those figures kind of stack up. Um, we've got about half of you. There we go. Is that okay? Right, so we've got some, some a poll before. Okay. Thank you, John. We appreciate your presentation this afternoon. Um, we'll now move on to our next presenter. With Jill Farrell, who is from the I have it on the University screen here, but I can't, systems, um, uh, unit. can't seem to she'll share it. She'll be talking it. about digital by design, designing learning and assessment in, in a digital age. And just to give you a little background about Jill, uh, okay, she well, has I think maybe we should, um, we should not dwell too much on the poll, but I think it's quite interesting to see that the, the first poll there, to support uh, all if areas we can of go, back to the, um, and go back to the slides. For expertise, um, Okay, so we've got um, uh, a large number of people using using video uh, in their programs. Um, we don't know exactly how that's being used, but nevertheless, uh, large percentage coming out in the as a sample of the people that are uh, that are supporting this. And I think um, similar sorts of numbers for people using uh, video for assessment, whether that's uh, assessment by being looked at or whether it's assessment that's self-generated. We're not sure, but there's a there's a trend for both of those things, uh, and I think what's interesting in this uh, Kaltura report is that something like 21% uh, are reporting that more than half their students are actively creating video, and that percentage has gone up quite substantially in the last year. Um, so there's a you know there's a big there's a big push and a trend uh, that we're anecdotally finding with our members using more video, and which seems anecdotally to be supported. Uh, by that little poll there and, and so on. So I, I think we can see those those kind of trends. Not too much of a surprise that those of us involved in distance education are using uh, these kind of things for remote teaching and learning. Um, the other um, the other aspect of it is this this rapid um, this rapid increase. Uh, there you can see uh, some of the year on year uh, changes. Um, easy to use tools for video capture uh, seem to be on the increase uh, and we'll have a little look at some examples of those uh, in a moment and um, it feels like the process for people to produce and develop these videos is perhaps getting a little bit easier. I noticed in the poll that uh, quite a few of you uh, were using uh, in-house content uh, and so on. 
so the um, the numbers are, are quite um, quite compelling, really, in terms of the the, tra the direction of travel. Um, the uh, NMC Horizon report for this year um, gives us perhaps um, only three key things that are of direct interest to people in distance education. Uh, although I would encourage you to have a look at this report, both this report and the other ones, by the way, are, are available as free downloads. Um, what we find, uh, not surprisingly, I suppose, is despite the increase of technology and online material and so on, uh, people's access to this is is unequal uh, across the world in terms of socio-economic groups, ethnicity, uh, and so on. And of course, uh, internet um, internet access is also variable, both in terms of speed and quality, even in, in even in developed countries. Um, the second thing that I think is relevant for distance education is, although you know, uh, understanding. Uh, what the digital stuff is, is, is one thing, but how we get it integrated and make sure that we're using it correctly uh, and becoming fluent in its use is another thing. Um, the third point, which I find absolutely fascinating, is that online, mobile and blended learning now is taken as a foregone conclusion. Uh, and in fact, the report goes on to say uh, that uh, institutions that don't have a strategy for integrating that uh, are going uh, are going to be in trouble. Um, so I think that's that's kind of a, an interesting interesting trend. So there's a there's just the um, the covers for those two bits of reports, which, as I say, you can have a look at uh, afterwards and, and download uh, download for yourselves. So what is the um, what is the role um, that technology is playing in this? Well, uh, let's focus primarily on on video. Um, and I think there are there is really uh, a couple of um, a couple of things that we can say about that. There's a greater uh, use of visual content in the ways that uh, technology is helping us to do that. And it comes with a warning, of course, if you use your own uh, if you use other people's content, you've got to be sure about what it's what its objectives are and where it comes from. Uh, but there are two or three great sources that I'm sure you all know about. Um, this is uh, YouTube. Uh, my field is leadership and management. I did a search yesterday and got over a million uh, a million hits um, and most of us I think have probably used YouTube to help us work out how to do a small task or, or learn something if we're not up there uh, using it for content for learning then a lot of people are using it as a place to um, give a sample of their course a sample of their program uh, and so on and, and um, you know that's a place where your students will, will perhaps expect you to be or, or to have a have a look at um, the next one, you may not be so familiar with this, I don't know, is this TeacherTube, which is um, specialises particularly in content that's been designed for education. Um, perhaps about three quarters of it is school based, but there's still nevertheless a significant chunk of, um, of content there that's uh, designed for, uh, for higher education. Uh, and you'll see on a similar sort of search, I've got over 500 uh, kind of results. Uh, for various um, aspects of leadership and so on. So, so some good sources of content. And then finally, the other one I'd like to show is our old friend, I call it an old friend, Ted. I mean, Ted's not been around a while now and it feels like it's, um, it's part of the furniture, but nevertheless, it's good stuff to use for high quality presentations that you might want to use to stimulate uh, and uh, get, your, get your students discussing things. I guess the biggest area um, that um, technology is making it um, easier for us is in the last two, which is about designing and making your own and getting students to design and collaborate. In fact, most of us probably find that our students are better actually doing this stuff than, uh, than we are as, um, as teachers and educators. Um, so I just wanted to, um, to show you one. This is not one that I've got um, an interest in, but it's, uh, it's an online, uh, it's an online um, service uh, for making your own animated uh, video clips and so on. There are similar tools for um, non-animation for those of you who, who feel that's not appropriate. But nevertheless, what's impressed me about this, I think, is actually you don't just get uh, the tools. There is actually some learning design uh, built into the process. <coughs> Excuse me. So if we have a look um, at this, this is the this is the uh, the opening page once you've you've signed up. Um, already we can see on the right 
a uh, three-stage process to writing the script, recording a voiceover and adding visuals. Uh, and the, um, the whole thing is uh, combined with the storyboard and everything. So there's some, there's some inbuilt things in there which I actually think are quite important. You get a little bit of help on uh, how to put your story together and, and some in-depth things that make it really quite straightforward for people to design their own, um, their own video. Uh, and then you come back and you can you can do the same thing for recording voiceover. There's um, you can do your own. You can um, get other voices that you can use, and you can add visuals and so on. So it becomes a much more um, easy to use experience. Another aspect of of video in the classroom is now the number of apps that are available just to help you make the videos. Uh, this one's from the Teacher Thought uh, website. Um, but you know all of these things are, are there for, for us to us to use, and uh, our EADL members are certainly making use of that to develop their own their own content. Where are we going next? Um, and it would appear from the um, the bits of research that I've highlighted that um, video continues to be kind of more pervasive and uh, and ingrained in what we do, and more important year on year. Uh, and um, will have a big impact on the um, on the kind of um, on the kind of learning processes. I think the um, the the other trend, which I think we're just starting to see at the beginning of, uh, is the use of apps. Now, I know a number of um, of institutions have designed apps. A number of learning providers have designed apps, and um, apps for education are increasing at a quite staggering rate, something like about 30% per year. Um, and I think it says a lot that if you look at uh, both Apple and Google, which is where those clips come from, uh, they both have mechanisms to help people uh, to develop uh, and create those kind of apps uh, in the classroom. And we're also starting to see um, development of similar sorts of uh, websites, similar sorts of processes for people without programming experience to start to make and create apps. And I suspect that the, uh, the trend for this uh, is going to increase so that we get to a point where it'll be almost as easy to make an app as it is to make a, make a video. And this is, uh, this is supported by some of the work that um, some of our, uh, our members have been doing. Um, this one is um, is in German. Um, it's from the um, BWL Institute in Switzerland, and it's it's really turning a number of concepts uh, in um, management into into kind of quiz and, and uh, cue cards uh, that work on on the mobile on the mobile phone. Uh, so you get um, a card with a quiz, you get some questions about a topic, and then you get a card uh, coming up with um, a question that you have to answer and so on so it's reinforced that so i put that up there as a as a as a trend i think that we're that we're seeing in terms of the way in which things are moving um just a reminder that wherever, wherever we go with this stuff it needs to be um uh, embedded in our uh, our underlying pedagogy um i like the um marguerite cool uh, framework uh, which seems a little bit old now which is quite interesting uh, but nevertheless, it you know it, it gets us to reflect on what devices we're using, using where the learners coming from, and, and kind of what's the sociability of uh, of mobile learning and, and where it fits together. So, um, in in summary, um, I think what we're finding is that the use of visual learning in distance education is growing, um, and that's a trend that looks set to to continue. Um, Technology is helping to support this development and perhaps driving it to some extent. The use of apps and mobile learning continues to grow um, and uh, there's a sense in which the, the sort of people that are coming on our programmes uh, will expect that. Um, the next generation is you know, going to be learning to, um, to make apps in primary school. Um, so um, when they turn they get to um, to higher education, it, it will be second nature, it'll be something else. Um, and probably uh, one of the things that we need to keep a focus on is our understanding of its impact on pedagogy um, and making sure that we keep ahead of that and how we can make sure we can integrate that 
uh, as it grows. And then lastly, uh, there are the, uh, the references which I say will be available uh, when, you, when you collect the slides. So thank you very much. That's uh, all I have to say for now and I look forward to the uh, panel discussion. Design of learning spaces, as well as good practice guidance and strategic planning and the project and change management needed to deliver enhancements in learning, teaching and research. She's directed projects in support of the strategic goals of the English and Scottish Higher Education Funding Councils and advised on the development of e-learning strategies for England and Wales. Thank you, Jill, for taking the time to be with us today, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Jill. That was a very enlightening presentation, and I think it gave us a lot to think about. Um, we've got a lot of participants today, and a lot of questions have come up in the chat. Uh, I'm going to start with the first set of questions, um, and that's from Gabriella, who's asked, this was directed at Hamish, but it can also be answered by other members of the panel. Um, good online assessment tools would be good to hear, or just the assessment method. Hi, everyone. Can I just check that you can hear me OK? We're having a few Online technical problems, tool. and I'm having real trouble getting in front of this camera, so I think I might just uh, turn it off in a second and uh, carry on. Yeah, the trouble with going last is um, I've now completely changed what I want to talk about, but you've got my slides already, so let's, uh, let, let's, let's make do and mend. Yeah. Um, as Lisa said, yeah, I work a lot with JISC in the UK, and I also coordinate the activities of the UNIS Learning and Teaching Task Force, which operates um, right across Europe. And what I'd like to just briefly talk about today is the outcomes of a JISC project that's looking at learning design, and then start to think about how we can use the outcomes of that work to continue the conversation across the, um, the wider European community. Now, the work that I'm talking about um, looks at learning design more generally, not, not specifically at uh, open or distance learning, um, but many of the principles and the lessons learned apply across all types of learning. Um, it, it feels to me as if uh, after a quiet period when people didn't talk much about learning design, um, it suddenly seems to be surfacing as a major theme of interest, um, certainly in terms of requests that JISC gets for guidance and um, renewed interest in an international learning design community, um, that, a network that I'll provide um, a little bit more information about at the end. So JISC's been working in this area for more than 10 years now. Um, I've highlighted some of the, the major programs of activity. And I'd really just like to stress the, the scale of the research that's gone on here. Um, as an example, uh, assessment um, seems to have popped up a, a few times today. The, the program that we did on assessment, um, it worked with 40 universities and directly with 2,200 staff and over 6,000 students. Um, there's a, a legacy of, of tools and resources that have come out of these activities that um, are still being used and adapted and have had a major influence on the way the sector approaches learning design. Now, I, I talked about fashions changing in the overview um, just because it gave me the chance to use some lovely photographs from Birmingham Metropolitan College. Um, but I, I do find it quite striking, um, especially when you're working on this kind of scale, that some of the small changes in thinking that, that we see happening incrementally, that they really add up to um, big shifts over time. And um, I want to talk about some examples where I see this direction of travel going and what I think it might mean for people developing open and distance learning. Um, I think the way, the whole way we view learning design, this whole space is, is much more holistic than it used to be. We used to talk about design and delivery as separate things. And I think that was founded on a, a content-based model whereby we 
designed learning content to be served up to students during a delivery phase. And the approach now is much more about designing learning activities and experiences, a, a much more learner-centered approach that doesn't say, what am I going to teach, but rather, how are these people going to learn? Um, content is no longer king, and the, the curriculum itself is, is much less of a fixed thing and much more a fluid set of activities that can produce different outcomes with different groups. Um, but I think the, this traditional focus on content rather than activities and experiences has been even more pronounced when it comes to online learning. Um, one of the things I've done with UNIS over many years is, is judge their annual e-learning award for many years. And we get loads and loads of entries from people who've created very high quality learning objects but without a clear idea how learners are expected to engage with them or what kind of difference it should make to, to their learning outcomes. Um, right, I should probably qualify that by saying we also get some excellent examples of learning design um, very often from people that are actively engaged with this, um, this Eden community. Um, but some of our top tips for learning design that I'll come on to in a minute um, really talk about that, uh, turning them more into engagement and activities. Um, couldn't agree more with what Hamish said about the extent to which assessment drives behavior. Um, one of the biggest shifts we've seen over the last few years is the move to an assessment for learning approach an approach that focuses on feedback and formative assessment activities rather than assessment of learning that, that's kind of summative and, and at the end. And although we're seeing that shift, I think it, it's an area that traditional practices dominate very, very slow to, to change. Um, I've, I've tapped in, into the um, chat box the URL for a, a guide we did on transforming um, assessment and feedback that, that I can't, haven't got time to go into a lot of the issues now, um, but you know, there's loads of, of good guidance in there. And it has really important implications for learning design because we need to ensure we build into these designs loops where feedback becomes a dialogue with a learner and to ensure that the learners get the feedback in a timely fashion so that they can act on it um, for, for the next assignment. And technology is helping us um, promote these approaches in, in many, many ways. Um, online formative assessment, self and peer assessment, um, are really, really powerful tools in enhancing learning. Um, and the increasing use of, of dashboards so that staff and learners have greater transparency about and a, a shared understanding of, of progress. Briefly mentioned um, employability here uh, and bundled it in with digital capability because the two are so interrelated. Um, it used to be that there were only certain kinds of subjects talked about employability and that's no longer the case. We, we can't view employability anymore as a, a fixed set of skills that you get from a particular course of study. Um, digital capability is, is key to future employability. It's, it's key to all professions becoming a digital professional uh, and really developing the capacity to be a lifelong learner. And I think it's, it's useful to make this connection for staff because it helps them see the need to ensure their own digital capability helps them meet the, the future needs of, of their learners. Um, you don't hear many people talk about digital literacy anymore because it's hard to get staff interested in that for its own sake, um, but talking about what it can actually do um, for, your, for your learners and their future needs. Learning analytics, um, really hot topic at the moment. Um, the amount of data we have about the curriculum and about learning can help us create better designs. However, most of the emphasis 
that you hear about learning analytics at the moment is on predictive analytics, it's on the individual learner, it, identifying learners at risk of dropping out, etc. Um, but it's equally useful to look at data about the curriculum itself and how it's designed. We need to be asking whether modules, com similar modules composed of different types of learning activity produce better or worse outcomes. Um, with digital information, we can also much more easily identify structural issues such as assessment bunching, over-assessment, and designs that don't allow for the, the type of feedback loops that I was talking about earlier. And in the online environment, we have a lot of data about students, but it's not necessarily any simpler to interpret. Um, just as turning up to a lecture doesn't mean a student learns anything, then simply logging on to the learning environment um, doesn't necessarily tell you how much, how much the student is engaging in learning activities. So how we use analytics to support the design of online learning space might be a, a topic that we want to um, talk about later. Um, I briefly mentioned changes to the physical learning space because they are exhibiting the, the same trends. And again, when we first started talking about next generation learning spaces, we were focused on access to content. We, we started with those temples of content, the libraries and learning resource centers. We began to understand the importance of social learning and see an, in, an increased emphasis on informal learning spaces. And it's much more recent that we're now tackling the, the last bastions of traditional teaching, the classrooms, the lecture theatres, and interactive lecture theatres, active learning classrooms are popping up everywhere. Other types of formal teaching space, such as science labs, we're seeing them become multidisciplinary where they're reflecting a, sh a shift in approach away from what I call recipe-based experiments, where all students do the same science experiment to produce a known outcome, to more problem-based approaches where students might be asked to design an experiment to shed some light on a problem. And the challenge in, in distance learning is, is how to reflect these types of changes in, in the virtual learning environment. Um, so the new guide that we've created is based on the assumption that nearly all of the learning that takes place in future is blended learning. It will involve some blend of online and face-to-face -face activities. So that's the emphasis we've, we've taken um, rather than talking about fully online courses, although we, we do talk about that in the guide. And the hints and tips here, I think, apply in both cases because in order to fully engage in online learning, students need to see the value, they, they need to believe it's not second best, and the way to make that happen is to see that staff value online learning, that staff engage with learners in those virtual spaces, and the students need to see these virtual spaces as places where they can engage, collaborate, and be part of an active learning community. Um, the approach we've used to staff development and the kind of tools we use to support learning design has changed a lot over the years. We used to be very focused on creating tools to support the sharing and reuse of learning design. Um, the tools that are most in use now are those based on stimulating conversation in a face-to-face -face setting. They're often based on a kind of a set of prompt cards that just help you ask the right questions and move things around physically to see the impact of different design decisions. And we get a very, very clear message that asking staff to do their initial learning design in a digital environment is a barrier to, to creativity. So um, what I've given you there is um, some links to some, some very, very popular staff development tools that are all um, freely available to, to use. 
Um, another clear message that we have, um, final message really, is um, the need for a strategic approach to staff development before staff are asked to engage in learning design. Um, at the minute, we've got some very good tools, some great examples, but it's a bit ad hoc and on demand. Um, there's a lack of understanding from senior managers about the need for a strategic approach and particularly about the skill set and the resource requirements needed for designing fully online learning, um, not exactly the same skills. So, um, you know, take a look at those those resources. Um, this is the model the new guide is based on. I'm not going to talk about it, um, but it's based on an appreciative inquiry approach that concentrates on what you do well and um, building on that. Um, if we've got a couple of seconds just to kind of stimulate the next discussion. Um, I thought it would be nice to hear from you. So I've, I've posed the question, um, what do you think is the essence of good learning design? And as you're all online, um, I guess you should be able to just go into menti.com and apply that code to give your views on the question. So menti.com. The code is 579789. I'm conscious of time, so I will um, come back to you later on with those results, um, publish the answers back to you. Um, what I will just show you here is um, the answers I got back from posing that same question to a group of people in the UK um, a couple of weeks ago. So, the GIST guide should be published in December. Um, the next step is looking at how GISC joins up the work it's doing around learning design and learning analytics to create some staff development resources on data-informed curriculum design. The international network I mentioned, um, it You've got the URL for its website. The next meeting is 24th of November, and um, you can participate virtually in that. Um, I'm very keen to extend this theme and this work um, to some workshops and activities around the annual UNIS conference, um, which takes place in Paris in June. If you're interested in that, please um, get in touch. And um, hearing John's talk, um, just made me think that you may also be interested in um, the Integrated Systems Europe um, event, which take place in February in Amsterdam. Um, there is an HE day on Tuesday, the 7th of February, where we'll be looking at integrated learning experience with AV tools, things like virtual reality, 360 degree video. So if you're interested, I will get the, um, the, the free invitation to, to that event um, extended to this community as well. Um, thank you very much. Sorry for my right, late arrival. Sure to check those out. Um, do you have any responses then, in addition to what Hamish has already said? Jill, did you have anything else to add? Okay, thank you. Um, I also appreciate the reference to David Nicole. I, I will definitely look into the into that book. Um, the next question, Ali, you asked about uh, the work that that Hamish is doing and the team of Edinburgh is doing on assessment. I think so I we've start? addressed that. Um, uh, yeah, um, good question. I mean, I think one of the things that I would say is that when you take uh, the, the act of assessment, even conventional forms of assessment online, you make lots of new things possible. So it's much easier when you have an electronic submission for students to include images, sounds, and so on in a conventional essay. Then if you take the next step, and as John was suggesting, um, if we want to use video in our practice, why not get students to make the videos? Um, and that can be incorporated then into the assessment. Um, 
thinking about tools, I, mean, I think there are some great tools for orchestrating peer assessment, and and I would like you know to suggest people look at uh, things like Peerwise, WebPA, as as possible ways of of um, allowing students to gain the experience of providing feedback. Uh, and um, uh, and interacting with their peers, uh, Jill, I think, used the phrase that assessment should become a conversation, and I think that's that's terribly important. And again, the electronic can make that conversation, the uh, the turn taking in that conversation, uh, can happen more rapidly, more more creatively. Um, just one last thought, I'll stop. Um, the notion of feed forward as well as feedback. Again, people will have come across this notion. A uh, colleague of mine, I think I mentioned Clara, Clara O'Shea, uh, does this actively in her uh, course on assessment. She offers the students the opportunity to uh, receive feedback on a late draft or feedback on the final summative piece. Uh, and she offers one or other, not both. So there's no increase in the workload for the teacher. But surprise, surprise, nearly every student opts for the feed forward opportunity. Uh, 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 and of course, one of the things that you are able to see then is not only, as it were, the quality of their unassisted work, but the, uh, the skill with which they engage with feedback and incorporate that feedback into the final piece. And that's a very, very important uh, skill to develop. I'll stop at that. And so uh, um, an additional add-on question to, to what you've asked. Orna asked a couple of questions in relation to um, John's presentation. Uh, is there really a need to distinguish mobile learning as all learning is essentially digital now? And should we design learning with no, the assumption I, I just students support what Penny says there about the, um, the feed forward. I mean, um, getting um, getting students to um, to engage with that is 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 is, is much more um, I think uh, formative for them in the sense that they, you know, they're learning as they as they go go through the go through the process and, and ultimately enhances their experience and, and stops them being. Uh, as concerned as they might be about the, um, the sort of summative type assessment. And uh, John, if you want to go ahead and respond to that. Yeah, I'm, I'm worried about speaking. I'm at an event. There's an awful lot of noise behind me, so just tell me if it's too distracting and I'll, I'll shut up. Yeah, I mean, I'm absolutely to, you know, echo what everybody has said that the way you create the feedback loops and the feedback environment is, is absolutely um, critical. Um, I suggest people look at um, the work of David Nicholl at Strathclyde University, um, the, the REAP project, redesigning, re-engineering assessment practice has been very, very influential in getting people to think about what are their principles for assessment and feedback and making sure that they design in accordance with those those feedback and the way that David's thinking developed over the years he, it's about um, trying to make students independent learners make them take responsibility for their own learning take control of their own learning he started thinking that self-reflection and self-evaluation was central to that, and it is. Um, but he, he began to think that um, peer review was even more important, and that actually constructing feedback for other people and comparing work, you know, if, if you set the same question, comparing your work with the work of others who've tried to answer the same question, the kind of cognitive processing that you do to generate that feedback for other people is, is even more valuable than, than trying to self-evaluate um, your own work. And yeah, somebody's just posted a question. REAP is R E A P. I'll um, I'll try and post you a, a link in a second. Jill, is there anything you'd like to add to the conversation? OK. 
Okay. Our next question is from Gabriella, and she has a question for all of the panel. Uh, do you all think that it would be good or useful for a training institution to have a person who could help with IT issues and IT methods um, to teachers who are not very familiar with these techniques compared to the case when a teacher has to do everything, teaching, designing materials, online, um, or everything together? So who would like to answer that question first? I, I just to come back to that. I think that's a, that's a really interesting um, a really interesting question because it it already shows how thinking from two or three years ago has, has probably has probably moved on because I think in essence what we're talking about now is is an integration of all of these all of these things and how we make sure that comes together in the design in the way that um, that Jill was talking about. So I'm not so sure that we need to make that distinction. It's about it's about the um, it's about the learning experience. Might I add an observation there, um, John? Yes, I, I, I completely agree with you. Um, if you like, learning is learning, the digital adds something. I think the mobile can add some other elements. Um, it, it, so if you think about what it's possible to do when you are out and about. So I think it, it, you know one of the things that you might think about would be uh, to be sending students out into the outside world to gather data, to gather evidence about some topic. So you know, it, 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 it's not so much the mobile per se, but it's when you've got a device which is portable and you've got a device which knows where it is, then there are things that we could do with that opportunity. So I think it's, it's thinking uh, openly about how we design experiences for our students. Sorry. We have another question from Stilianos, and he's asked, are there any I guess only to say that, I mean, when you're thinking about supporting people managing their own learning as well, and, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on dashboards and things like that at the moment, um, but we're finding that apps, apps that people have on their phone, in their pocket, they're, you know, things that are pushing things about your progress out to you, students, busy learners are, are, are much more likely to take notice of something that's just on an app and feels so easy to them rather than having to log into some big system and, and find what you're looking for, you know, with they, they'll log into these things, you know, two or three th times over the first few weeks and then you find it kind of drops off, whereas if, if they've got an app in, in their pocket, they're more likely to find it convenient to engage with. Yes, may I? Um, just a thought on that, Jill, and forgive me if you said this in your earlier presentation, but timely feedback um, about how things are going. It, it, there's a lot of evidence that that promotes retention on program. And, and so, I mean, it doesn't matter if the feedback is good or bad, actually. It's just to know that you've got some measure of what's going on. And yes, I think that's, that's possibly very well done uh, in the mobile context, uh, because that's, as it were, a Forgive me, I'll use the hideous phrase, I'm a biologist by background and I hate it, but um, a shot of dopamine, you know, you can give the students uh, a, a bit of supportive feedback very readily through, uh, through a mobile. I had a follow-up question since we don't have any further questions in the chat unless um, anyone would like to add their question if I missed one. Um, during the presentations, you know, Hamish talked about uh, assessment driving behavior. Um, John was talking about realizing fluency um, within the, 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 the NMC Horizon report. Um, Jill was talking about the challenges of 
you know, having actual, actual uh, active learning spaces. And I saw these as some real challenges. Can I just um, go how for a yes? Can, um, uh, these it's disingenuous for somebody in an institution you, like Edinburgh. Um, you know, we have massive resources that can support students. So I think, I beg your pardon, my, my staff, uh, colleagues, teachers. Um, and so perhaps there's a bit of me which values the message that we can do a lot of things quite readily by ourselves. And it's quite empowering to go that way. But as I say, uh, that's easily said when you've got a lot of backup. So that, you know, that there's a tension there. Um, I think you know, if, if we can design and build rather than design and pass on or, or some other model that helps us to think through, it's like a, you know, a constructionist model of learning. We externalize what we want to achieve by building uh, systems in which our students can work. So I think, you know, having support, great, working, tinkering with things oneself, bricolage, great, um, but as I say, easy. Yeah, I think there's some, <clears throat> I think there's something here um, that might be a blockage in, in, in people's minds, maybe a blockage in my own mind, but it's, it's, it's about the distinction between um, something that, that's, that's formal and something that's informal. So you don't want to lose the informality of, of what comes from the, the, the teacher being involved with the students in helping to, to create something or do something. On the other hand, you know, there, there's a limit to the amount of, um, of expertise one should expect somebody to have and that, that, therefore you, know, you, want, you want to be able to go somewhere in the organisation or if it's not in the organisation outside where you can get that expertise and, and I suppose that's what, that's what some of the things that I was pointing to, to those tools and apps are, are doing, they're sort of short circuiting some of that process and, and putting it outside of, of the institution. Some institutions tend to apply a kind of core plus model that there are some core institutional systems that, you know, are fully supported, you can get full training in, and there are others that are recommended. We know other people have found them too useful, but we can't actually support them to the same extent, you know, a lot of the kind of free and open source tools, and I think that's actually quite a good model because the the digitally you know the, the 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 more digitally competent people can become the more they're able to just use these tools that are useful for a while and then move on to the the next thing as uh, as, as things develop and it gives the institutions a way to be flexible and adaptable without you know being expected to fully support ev everything that uh, somebody could suddenly want to use Beginning, can I, I'm in confessional mode, uh, it appears today. Um, uh, I think on our program, which is a program on digital education, then again, it's very easy for us. Because when we try something new and it works, the students say, that's great, I'm going to try that. And when we try something new and it falls flat in its face, the student says, that's great, we've learned so much from what you did. Um, in any other area, students want it to work. And so I think we do lose credibility in the face of our students if stuff goes wrong. So experimentation, absolutely, by all means. But I, you know, as I say, I think it's very easy for us, um, for people in other domains, you don't want to lose credibility, respect, uh, trust of your students. Uh, by doing stuff which falls flat. So, you know, it, again, it, it's operating at this this margin, uh, trying new things, but not putting yourself out there so that you're taking too many risks. Uh, even when I say that, it troubles me. To, you know, I like risk. Um, so it troubles me to say that. But, you know, we, we have to be practical, I think, and, and think about how our students will respond. 
I mean, often when things go wrong, we we gain a bit of humanity. We gain, you know, we we go for the uh, the sympathy vote, but we don't want to drag our students into stuff which um, it gets in their face and gets in their way. You might want to um, look at the University of Exeter students as change agents program. They've done some um, excellent work actually asking students to design research projects around the use of technology, you know, what kinds of technologies would be useful in their learning and their situation and, you know, really do it as a formal research project and, and, and work with their tutors to, you know, evaluate this stuff. And I, I know there's a, there's a fear of, um, in many cases, just kind of looking foolish in front of students if, if things don't work, but, you know, actually engaging the, the students in talking about what kind of stuff is, is useful has is, worked really well in, in uh, many, many areas. Are there any other responses to this question? There's quite a bit of uh, chat activity going on. I'm trying to see if there's any questions here. Okay. Um, one of the comments that was made uh, earlier in the session was that we see some of, and this came from Pedro, he was... Um, I, for me, uh, I, I think it is this notion of a task with a backstory. So, uh, you know, if you... Uh, uh, this is a. This could turn into a very long, shaggy dog story, and I'll try and keep it brief. But the the difference, for example, between asking a student to write uh, a review of a text and asking the student to take a text and, with a given audience in mind, and giving them a particular role with respect to that audience write on that text in a way which addresses the role that you've been given. As I say, I could give examples, but I would get carried away. But I, as I say, think about the backstory. Think about how it relates to the students developing identity as a historian or an engineer or a doctor or whatever, and cast the task in the context of that backstory. That would be my, you know. I think, um, yeah, I... I think my answer to that is it, it, it kind of depends on the, uh, and it probably is, is a bit of a follow-on from what Amy just said, it kind of depends on the context uh, and uh, in terms of what it's being used. I mean, I know, I know um, one of the, um, one of the, one of the schools that uh, does a social media for course, for example, does use uh, a lot of uh, online um, assessment, and, and that has got a lot of you know playfulness in it in terms of the way in which it's way in which it's put together. So I think I think it kind of depends on the the context for that. Yeah, I, I agree with with. Um what Hamish said, and, and maybe you could replace the word playful with creative. Um, you know, people are very creative and just giving them, asking them the question and, and giving them the means to use what, whatever medium they feel suitable to, to actually produce the answer in, I think is, um, you know, if people are, feel creative, then they're getting a sense of enjoyment and ownership uh, about what they're doing. So, you know, maybe it's a, a similar. Are starting more blended initiatives, and I and I know that the open universities are, are kind of running and um, facing a crisis at the moment. So my follow-up question to the panel would be, how do you see this, and how, how, would you, how would you anticipate this moving forward? Do you think that open universities will be moving toward more blended initiatives? Okay, Hamish, I've got a couple more questions for you, and I think that's all we'll be able to fit, fit in for today. Um, and these are from Stilianos, and it's, there, it's about four questions, so 
So I'll try to read these to you. I've also put them in the presenter notes. Um, what are some sources of intrinsic motivation for students you've encountered? And how can we help them discover those sources? And do you use online collaborative activities for student assessment? And if, if we're so, thinking about for evaluate. credit assessment, it might actually be our regulatory processes. Um, I, I, and not only our regulatory processes, but the illusions which many colleagues have about what the regulations will and will not allow. Um, the regulations are often not as restrictive as colleagues believe them to be. So I think as one wants to do things like, for example, peer assessment, you've got to be talking to the right senior colleagues so that the regulatory processes won't get in the way of what you're trying to do. Remind me never to follow Hamish when answering questions again. I, I agree with absolutely everything he said. Yeah, yeah, if you want to know what the biggest challenges are, they're assessment, assessment, and assessment. Um, the, the, and not just um, staff kind of being set in their way. You know, some of this stuff is so high stakes that people are worried about changing it, and students are worried about changing it. I mean, good students are very good at playing the game of how we do assessment at the moment. Um, you know, you're a bright student. You might like summative assessment because it means you don't have to work for quite a lot of the, the year. It's, you know, it, it's, it's challenging for staff and students to actually change these models and some of the urban myths you hear, particularly um, if there are professional bodies um, involved in validating qualifications is they won't let us do that, they won't like that. And for the most part, they are urban myths. Uh, we explored that in, in programs we did that what people thought their own regulations said and stopped them doing frequently that the regulations didn't say that at all. It was how people locally had chosen to interpret them and, and this becomes just embedded in, in layers and layers of, of procedure. So, um, you know, try and look at these layers of procedure you've got between the strategy, the vision for what you're trying to achieve and actual practice and, and just see how, if they're actually serving your needs. Really. <clears throat> I think I, <clears throat> I, I agree with all about and in terms of what Jill and Hamish has said. I think one of the things that um, is kind of curious is that you know, we're at a stage where the, the learner or the student can produce their own digital portfolio. Uh, and so on, and yet that that doesn't seem to 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 feature too much in in some of the um, requirements of the assessment bodies in terms of the professional bodies, for example, that, that um, some of our organisations deal with. Um, but it prob probably exists. So I think I think there are those those kind of those kind of issues. <clears throat> but I think also this field is you asked about digital fluency. I think it's changing so fast that that you know we all have. Uh, we all have the the issue of keeping up with it, uh, and 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 at the same time as we're trying to keep up with it, we're also trying to take a step back and analyse the trends and and see where it goes and whether it fits in with what we've learned before. Um, and and as you as you, I don't mean this is an ageist thing, but as you get older, you get a bit more reflective about that. Whereas if you look at, at younger people, they just do it intuitively. John and Jill, if you would like to add something to what Hamish just said. Okay, John, I'm not. John, did you have any follow-up comments? Well, maybe I'll, I'll go first because I don't know that I can actually talk particularly about open universities, but what I would say about um, the sorts of, um, uh, if you like, from, the, from a private sector perspective is that the, the, the degree of, of blended 
that you put in is very much down to what the um, the customer, either the student or the client, if it's an organisation, actually wants in the design of the process. Um, I think, by and large, we know that you know a blended a blended approach is probably better than a complete remote approach, or uh, and and so on. So. Um, getting getting that blend in there seems to me to be um, an important element. It's not always possible, um, but it wouldn't surprise me if we if we do see more open uni universities actually moving in that direction. And and there comes a point when the distinction of, of distance, uh, which is still a, a term that we use, is is probably not helpful anymore because it, you know it, we're all in the learning uh, the learning game, uh, the learning process, and we're just offering different. Different ways of getting at that, um, getting at that learning. Yes, if I could. Yeah, again, I. I... Oh, sorry, Joe. Sorry, no, I was going to say I, I don't, you know, I, I don't really feel qualified to, to talk about where open universities are, are, are going, but just seeing that um, Coursera, the, the MOOC provider, has started creating physical learning hubs um, makes me think that it, it's not an issue that, that's going to, to go away. And what we can do in physical learning spaces that we can't do online is, is, is and how people feel that that gives them a sense of community that's important important to their their learning uh, I don't think that's something that's going to go away yes sorry forgive me interrupting I I, I I think the point about how do we define distance is an interesting one um, I, a colleague of mine Jeff Haywood um, claims that he never said this but I, I think I heard him saying that if you are more than six rows back in a 500 seater lecture theater you're a distance learner and, and you know, and I think that's very true. Um, and then when asked questions, well, distance from what, and 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 you know, distance from one's peers, distance from one's teachers, um, and I, I think uh, Jill's absolutely right. Ways of cultivating social exchange, opportunities for social exchange. I would say one can do that in an entirely online program. But you know, I'm contractually obliged to say that because that's what we do. Um, but uh, I think there are ways of engineering uh, meaningful social interactions without space. But I think appropriate design of space is a good way of doing that. And often the campus spaces that we have as legacy from uh, previous modes of teaching and learning don't serve that purpose very well. And again, I would come back to the to the the mobile. Often, mobile gives us an opportunity to touch gently with one another, even if we're not co-present. And 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 that can be an important uh, cement for the social interactions that are important in a in a learning community. So I think we're talking here about community, and there are different ways of, of helping community to happen. Okay. All right. Well, I would like to take a moment to thank everyone for, for coming today uh, to the session, and especially our speakers who did a fabulous job despite tech, technology um, hiccups along the way. Uh, we were able to get this, get this through. Um, just a couple of comments to those of you who are still here. Tonight will be the Eden chat session at 8 o'clock in the evening Central European time, and we'll be touching on um, some of the topics that will be here and uh, well, that have been discussed I, I think, during the uh, yeah. yeah. I'm inclined to say anybody who wants to pursue that, mail me. But I think the answer is uh, probably yes, 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 and yes. Um, we have done group assignments, which uh, which given a, a grade to the group. And there's lots of scholarship around about how you manage that and how you uh, support students. I, I think it was Joe made the point that uh, when you get students to work together in that way, they learn about how their peers approach a task 
and that's very very valuable to see how somebody else might do something um intrinsic motivation right okay um i, I think two quick answers to this one um whatever we can but again it's easy when you have relatively small groups of 20 30 people if you've got large groups it becomes difficult but we try and negotiate assignments with students so you've got a broad area of activity that you want you know you, you you've got an assignment task that you can negotiate with the student about how that task is directed you know the topic that they take for example uh, and that i think uh, bootstraps intrinsic motivation just giving students agency is a good thing and if you can give them agency in the, the topic that they approach second related to that agency thing we sometime um, in some places in the program there are uh, opportunities for the students to add assessment criteria to the standard assessment criteria so you've got a task and you say so is there anything that you would particularly like to be doing with this task which we could add to the assessment criteria and i can give you feedback specifically on that aspiration so those would be two uh, quick answers tomorrow and the next day on the topics of maybe christina you could help me out and put those in the chat box because i don't have them right in front of me um, and the, as, as I mentioned before, the recordings of today and the slides will be available on the Eden site. And I'm also in contact with Rike, who unfortunately Try, is not finding it difficult to actually today. think of a, uh, a quick answer to, better, to, um, to that one as well. Yeah, I mean, certainly that point about engaging today, students uh, with the assessment criteria, asking them to explain them, rewrite them in their own words, or even don't give them any criteria. Ask them what you know, what criteria, against which criteria do you think um, this piece of work should should be judged. I think all that is, is motivating. I was trying to um, pick as well to find, and I'm, I'm sorry, I can't find the link at the moment. Um, the Norwegian Business School is doing some really interesting stuff with group exams. Um, and actually, you know, people submitting things for, as they call exams, as, as a, a group. But I, I will keep trying to actually find the, um, the link for that. On the Eden website, so you you will even if you came here today to see Rick as well, um, please be sure to come back to the to the website. Um, Christina has posted the topics for the next day. Um, tomorrow um, they'll be reconsidering access, quality, and flexibility of ed education, um, and uh, then there on Friday will be a live open classroom conference. Uh, which is happening right now in Lithuania. Um, they'll be delivering the plenary session. So we hope you enjoyed the session today and thank you everyone for coming and especially our speakers. Thank you very much. You did a wonderful job. Bye everyone. Thank you for coming.
Thank you all. Thanks, Lisa. Bye. Bye.